Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. Before I get into today's program, I'd like to read an excerpt from Martin Luther, uh, the Martin Luther of the 1500s, not Martin Luther King from the 1960s. You have to tell people that these days. Uh, this comes from Luther's main treatise on civil government, temporal authority, to what extent it should be obeyed. As John Calvin had his treatise on the doctrines of civil government in his work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, this is Luther's piece on the subject. Rather than buying it, you can do what I did. Find it online and just print it off. It's about 20 pages. So if you think the state of politics is bad today, if you think politicians are godless and unprincipled in our day, Martin Luther writes back in 1523, You must know that since the beginning of the world, a wise prince is a mighty rare bird. And an upright prince is even rarer. They are generally the biggest fools or the worst scoundrels on earth. Therefore, one must constantly expect the worst from them and look for little good, especially in divine matters which concern the salvation of the soul. So not much has changed in 500 years. Rather than being frustrated, we should be thankful that God resists evil in the hearts of men because it could be a whole lot worse. Uh, the miracle is, despite the fact that we live in a fallen world, where people are walking according to the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that's now working in sons of disobedience, our property and our lives are generally protected. We have freedom to worship and to evangelize, which is our main task on earth. Well, after Luther states that godly princes are rare, he explains why. Quote, They are God's executioners and hangmen. His divine wrath uses them to punish the wicked and to maintain outward peace. If a prince should happen to be wise, upright, or a Christian, that is one of the great miracles, the most precious token of divine grace upon the land. Ordinarily, the course of events is in accordance with this passage from Isaiah chapter 3. I will make boys their princes, and gaping fools shall rule over them. And Hosea 13. I will give you a king in my anger, and take him away in my wrath. The world is too wicked and does not deserve to have many wise and upright princes. Frogs must have their storks. So this is Martin Luther. Uh, his writings are always very blunt and crudely honest. As frogs have storks that eat them, uh, God sends wicked politicians to eat wicked citizenship making their lives miserable. And we ought to remember this truth, that evil rulers disturb or ruin the lives of the unsaved way more than the lives of God's people. Uh, it's their own car they're driving off the cliff. We have our citizenship in another country, in the kingdom of Christ. And our goal is not utopia on earth, but a civic environment that will best help people see their need for Christ, be that good or bad. To see their need for his righteousness and his eternal kingdom. Now, for the next two programs, I'm going to set aside what is happening uh, in the news and discuss two issues in regard to the doctrines of civil government. Besides, you know, how much more do you need to hear about the Mueller report and unhinged liberal rage? Uh, well, in the next program, I'm going to be discussing Martin Luther's Two Spheres, Two Kingdom Doctrine of the State and the Church. And on today's program, I'd like to answer a question that I get quite often from listeners. What Old Testament laws are to be carried over into the New Testament or over into Gentile nations? And this is no small subject because the book of Acts includes much material about this transition from Old Testament rules and regulations to freedom in Christ. In Acts chapter 10, Peter receives a vision that abrogates the dietary laws of the Old Covenant. Uh, 
Acts chapter 10, verse 15, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And the first church council, Acts chapter 15, the council of Jerusalem, it wasn't about the Trinity or the deity of Christ. Those doctrines were assumed. But the first issue in question was which Old Testament laws should be applied to the Gentiles? Which laws should be carried over into the new covenant? Because Acts chapter 15, verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. These were the Judaizers. And the ruling of the apostles was that the yoke that was placed upon the Jews under the Mosaic covenant would not be placed upon the Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles are now living in the new covenant and they are not under the Mosaic law. And this has application not only to the church, but to civil laws in many countries. For example, Christian nations do not prohibit the eating of pork, as do Muslim nations. And this question concerning the role of the Old Testament in the times of the New Testament is very important because every new Christian will ask this question. Every Christian reads in the Bible all of these Old Testament dietary laws and legal statutes and wonders if they are still to be applied today. And if they're not to be applied literally, is there some spiritual or in principle application? Should we prohibit loans that go beyond six years? Are we to establish cities of refuge for murderers? Should we circumcise? Should we prohibit uh, money being lent out at interest? Exodus chapter 22, verse 25. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. And in the Middle Ages, the church applied uh, these prohibitions against lending money with interest as a universal, timeless civic law. And this creates all sorts of economic problems because there is an intrinsic cost in using other people's money. Uh, if I can make 25% return on money that I borrow at 5%, everybody's helped. So this question of the role of the Old Testament is very relevant for those who want to follow the law of God, uh, those who want the word of God to be a moral guide. Now, the critics of the Bible have used these Old Testament laws to discredit the use of the Bible in determining moral law today. And the classic example, which I've referred to often, is President Obama, back in 2006, his speech at Sojourners. Sojourners is a leftist religious group. Uh, this was one of those speeches where Barack Obama declared that we're no longer a Christian nation. And... He references the regulations of the Old Testament to make the case that the Bible cannot and should not be used to determine laws in modern society. Therefore, law has to be a function of man, not the dictates that come from any book that claims to be God's revelation. Quote from Barack Obama, Moreover, given the increased diversity of America's population, the dangers of sectarianism, have never been greater. Whatever we once were, we are no longer just a Christian nation. We are also a Jewish nation, and a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, a nation of non-believers. And even if we did have only Christianity in our midst, if we expelled every non-Christian from the United States of America, whose Christianity would we teach in the schools? Would we go with James Dobson's? or Al Sharpton's? Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with Leviticus, which suggests that slavery is okay and that the eating of shellfish is an abomination? How about Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick with the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own defense department would survive its application? So before we get carried away, Let's read our Bibles 
folks have not been reading their Bibles. Now, just as the devil is prone to do, God's prohibitions are twisted and exaggerated. In order to discredit them, Barack Obama misrepresented the scriptures. Leviticus does not suggest forced slavery is okay. Eating shellfish is not described as an abomination, as is homosexuality. And Deuteronomy does not teach that children who stray from the faith ought to be stoned. This is just an example how the left discredits the authority of the Bible. They take aspects of the Mosaic law for Israel, which are no longer enforced in the New Testament, and they use those to cast doubt on the eternal, timeless moral law of God. Now, what Barack Obama was trying to do is not trying to justify the eating of shrimp and lobster. The last time I looked, that is not the culture war of our day. Obama was trying to use these prohibitions against shellfish as a way to undermine the law of God to justify abortion and homosexuality. Uh, President Obama actually began his speech by quoting his Illinois Senate opponent, Alan Keyes, who stated that Barack Obama was in opposition to God in his support for abortion and homosexual marriage. So Obama used the shellfish argument as an answer to refute Alan Keyes and those who use the Bible to argue against abortion and homosexuality. In other words, how can you believe in the veracity of biblical moral law when eating something as harmless as shellfish is prohibited? So what I'm saying here is that this question of which laws apply in our day is very important in this whole culture war. And Christians need to provide provide an answer. Titus chapter 1 verse 9, uh, exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Now, if we simply answer by saying those Old Testament laws were abrogated by God, the change itself is used as an indictment. The critics respond by saying, if God's law can change, then God's laws are relative. They're based upon circumstances. They are therefore a social construct for the time. And so relativism has some validity. If God's laws have changed, how can we be sure that the laws prohibiting homosexuality haven't changed? Now, we can go to the New Testament and show that uh, the prohibitions against homosexuality are repeated in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, in Romans chapter 1, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in 2 Peter, and in the book of Jude, and the book of Revelation. But still, any change in God's law appears to undermine uh, the entire moral law of God for those who do not understand the purpose and plan for these temporary non-moral regulations given by Moses for ancient Israel. So not only must we show that these Old Testament ceremonial dietary and judicial laws were temporary, we must explain why they were temporary and which moral laws are permanent. And we must show how this is very obvious in Scripture and it is obvious for those who study their Bibles. And to quote Barack Obama, folks have not been reading their Bibles. Case in point, Barack Obama before he gave his speech. Now, given the length of this program, There is no way that I'm going to be able to completely cover this topic, but at least I can make a few points and send you off in the right direction. First, John Calvin, in his treatise on civil government, chapter 20, book four, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, has a few sections concerning what is the law for civil magistrates in our day. And he answers those in his day who believed that the law of Moses was meant to be a timeless pattern for all nations, that thieves must pay exactly double 
what they have stolen. Exodus 22, 7. Uh, that in the seventh year, debts are, debts are to be forgiven. Deuteronomy 15, 1. And that farmers cannot plant their crops in the seventh year. Leviticus 25. So Calvin writes, There are some who deny that any commonwealth is rightly framed, which neglects the law of Moses and is ruled by the common law of nations. So Calvin is answering those who insist on the implementation of the Mosaic law in current society. And his answer is that Christians must rightly divide the law of Moses into that which is the permanent moral law of God and that which was temporary, the ceremonial and the judicial case law. Quote, in order to understand how far they do or do not pertain to us, he writes, the ceremonial laws of the Jews was a tutelage by which the Lord was pleased to exercise, as it were, the childhood of that people until the fullness of time should come when he was fully to manifest his wisdom to the world and exhibit the reality of those things which were then umbriated by figures. Galatians 3.24, 4.4, the judicial law given them as a kind of polity uh, delivered certain forms of equity and justice by which they might live together innocently and quietly. And this is Hebrews chapter 9. Speaking about the Mosaic law, which is a symbol for the present time, accordingly both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they related only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. The time of Reformation, as it's described in the book of Galatians, is the New Covenant. The time when the people of God were given the new birth and the indwelling Spirit of God to guide them. As it was before the Spirit of God was given, the people of God were kept in check by these external disciplines. And the main purpose of these Old Testament laws, uh, the dress code, the dietary laws, was to create a wall, a barrier to separate the Jews from the Gentiles. And this is seen in Acts chapter 10 in the connection between the dietary laws and Peter associating with the Gentiles. It's similar to keeping your children from going out into the streets uh, to play with the bad kids in the neighborhood. God created for the Jews these cultural barriers, physical barriers to keep them away from the Gentiles. In Galatians 3.23, the Jews were kept in custody under the law. Paul calls these Old Testament laws elemental things. In Galatians 4.3, uh, these rules were not based upon universal morals. As Calvin writes, Meanwhile, let no one be moved by the thought that the judicial and ceremonial laws relate to morals. Uh, just like there are no uh, universal moral laws that say teenagers need to be back in the house by 9 p.m., you know, these are extra rules or fences for naive, undisciplined, immature people to keep them away from moral corruption. The moral law of God never changes, but the fences necessary to keep people away from moral corruption may change based upon the character or the internal discipline of the people involved. I mean, we all know that children need more imposed discipline and rules. Now, what we fail to understand often is this need for extra fences before the giving of the new covenant and the giving of the Spirit. Uh, that God, in His wisdom, created these extra fences around the Jewish nation. God knew exactly which cultural barriers were necessary. And God knew that these dietary restrictions and codes uh, would have the necessary isolating effect upon the Jews. And God even understood that these additional rules would become a source of self-righteous pride in some Jews. That they would make these laws for separation their religion and the source of their salvation. But God was allowing this to test their hearts. So John Calvin goes on to explain that the judicial law 
the case laws were polity given specifically to Israel. But even though the specific judicial laws are removed, the duties and the precepts of charity still remain perpetual. We can still draw timeless principles, uh, the timeless principle that thieves ought to make restitution, uh, that people should not be perpetually in debt, and that resources and land should not be monopolized. You don't want to have a, an owner class and a peasant class. Quote from Calvin, but if it is true that each nation have been, has been left to liberty to enact the laws which it judges to be beneficial, still these are always to be tested by the rule of charity so that while they may vary in form, they must proceed on the same principle. So Calvin goes on to explain that nations have the liberty to enact different penalties based upon the needs of the country. Don't be offended by the diversity of laws and penalty as long as the object is to fulfill the God-given calling of magistrates in Romans chapter 13 to be an avenger against those who practice evil. Quote, the Lord did not deliver it, the old covenant, by the hand of Moses to be promulgated in all countries and to be every, everywhere enforced. But having taken the Jewish nation under his special care, patronage, and guardianship, he was pleased to be its special legislator and as becomes a wise legislator, he had special regard to enacting its laws. Now, this is not to say that John Calvin is the final authority here, as if I'm a disciple of John Calvin. But John Calvin was the man. But what I'm simply saying is that John Calvin represented the historic position in this regard. Martin Luther, in his treatise on the role of civil government, came to the exact same conclusions. Old Testament, Mosaic, ceremony, and judicial law does not apply to Gentiles today. Now, in this regard, be aware of present-day theonomists or Reconstructionists, as they're called, uh, those who teach that if America is ever to get right with God, America must enforce all the details of the Mosaic law excluding dietary laws. Uh, these theonomists like Rush Dooney and Gary Banson and Gary North and Gary DeMar and David Chilton and the Chalcedon Foundation are very popular in some homeschool groups and among some Orthodox Presbyterian circles. You know, they believe that the Old Testament judicial law is timeless and mandatory. Now, the best resource I found in explaining the errors of the Theonomists is this book by Greg Durant, Judicial Warfare, Christian Reconstruction, and its Blueprint for Dominion. Uh, you can now get this book on Amazon. Uh, Greg Durant was caught up in the movement himself. He discovered the biblical errors, and he does a great job unpacking the issues. But the bottom line, is that the historic Christian position is that the moral law of God is timeless, but the specific judicial penalties in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy are only case laws, examples to be applied in principle. How do we know this for sure? Well, basic understanding of Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 15, Galatians chapter 3 and 4, uh, the entire book of Hebrews, uh, these scriptures that explain the extent and the purpose of the Old Testament law. Even rabbis today will tell you that the Mosaic law was only for Israel, not for the Gentiles. But one thing is for sure. The moral law of God, the law that existed on the hearts of every man, even before the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, were given at Mount Sinai, has never changed. Paul writes about this natural law in Romans chapter 2. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are law to themselves, in that they show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. Every man has the Ten Commandments written 
on the heart. People knew that murder and theft and sexual immorality and sexual deviance were wrong even before Moses gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And capital punishment for murder was also universal. It was required of Noah and all of his descendants, Genesis chapter 9. So this Noahic covenant is called the everlasting covenant in Isaiah 24, 5. And so all the inhabitants of the earth are held guilty for unpaid for blood guilt. In Leviticus 18, there are laws against sexual immorality. And there Moses explains that these moral laws were not just for Israel, but were applied to all nations. Because of these immoralities, God judged the Egyptians and the Canaanites. Leviticus 18.24, do not be defiled or do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all of these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. God did not judge these Gentile nations for failing to keep sabbatical laws by charging interest, but he did judge these Gentile nations in accordance with the universal, timeless, moral laws of God, natural law. And the Old Testament prophets in their oracles against Gentile nations, pronounce judgment on Gentile nations for their immoralities and for their thefts. They were still held to the standards of God's moral law, even though they were not held to the specifics of the Mosaic judicial case law. Check out Amos chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul even refers back to these sexual laws in Leviticus 18 in stating that it's still immoral under the new covenant for a man to marry his stepmother. There are natural relationships. There are boundaries in those relationships which should not be crossed. 1 Corinthians 5.1 It is actually reported that there is immorality among you an immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. And in 1 Timothy 1.9, Paul states that the moral law of God is still applicable. Realize the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill fathers or mothers, as in euthanasia, for murderers, and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. And in the day of judgment, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, all mankind will be judged for their murders and their immoralities and their sorceries and their idolatries and their lies. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So mankind will be held accountable to the moral law of God. And this is not that hard to understand. God expects us to study the word, to study our conscience, to put this all together and to deduce what are the universal timeless laws of nature and nature's God. It's really not a hard task for people who have pure hearts, but it's an almost impossible task for those people who have an animosity toward God and for those who want to justify their lawlessness. So this was a quick introduction into this whole subject of the law of God for nations. Which laws must magistrates enforce in civil society? And it's not the details of the Mosaic Code instituted for Israel, but the timeless, unchanging moral laws of God written in the Scripture and on the hearts of men. Uh, Magistrates are responsible to be avengers who bring wrath on the ones who practice evil. If you'd like more information about this subject, a number of years ago I put together a seven-lesson series explaining page by page uh, John Calvin's treatise on civil government. It's a booklet containing Calvin's treatise and three teaching CDs. So if you're interested in this free resource, Email me at godandcountryradio at verizon.net.
uh, send me your mailing address and I'll send you a copy. Eventually, when I put up the new God and Country website, I hope to have this resource for you uh, to download. But for now, I'm just going to have to send you the hard copy. Again, thanks for making God and Country a part of your discipleship in the Word. I, I hope that these lessons are helpful for you. I hope they're encouragement. I hope that they keep you from error and help you to be fruitful in your service for the kingdom of Christ. Uh, let me close with Paul's doxology to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4.18 The Lord will rescue me and you from every evil deed and bring us safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God richly bless you.